This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zakheim, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, Reagan Institute Director of Scholarly Initiatives, Dr. Anthony Eames, sits down with Dr. Melvin Leffler, who is the Edward Stettinus Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Virginia. They discuss Dr. Leffler's new book entitled Confronting Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush, and the Invasion of Iraq. Welcome to Reaganism. I'm Anthony Eames, your guest host for today and director of scholarly initiatives at the Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. And I'm so very pleased to be joined here today by the Dean of U.S. Foreign Relations Scholarship, uh, or the Academy, I should say, uh, Mel Leffler, who is a emeritus professor of American history at the University of Virginia, uh, winner of the Bancroft Award, the Farrell Prize, and many other prizes for historical scholarship, and now out with a timely new book, uh, Confronting Saddam Hussein, uh, George W. Bush, and the Decision to Invade Iraq, um, out just in time for the 20th anniversary. Uh, Mel, thanks for coming on. We're so happy to have you here. I'm delighted to join you. It's a pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. So... Um, you know, there, you have quite the lineup of of uh, endorsements here on the back. Uh, it ranges from people who are actually in the administration uh, to scholars, but everyone pretty much says you you have written the definitive, incisive history of of the Iraq War, the decision to invade Iraq. Um, before we even get into all of that, first, if you could kind of lay out where this conflict fits within the broader scope of U.S. foreign relations, um, helping our listeners, one, to understand why are we doing something about Iraq on a Reaganism podcast, and two, why might it matter for today? Well, I mean, that's that's a great question, and I think the, the important thing to realize when one assesses the history of American foreign policy is to examine the role of ideas and ideology, the importance of power, relative power, the definition of interest, and the assessment of threat. I think those sorts of critical variables have shaped the evolution of American foreign policy from its very origins. Of course, the nature of interests have changed. The assessment of relative power has been transformed over time. Perceptions of threat and of enemies change. But these are critical variables. They've been critical variables for the entirety of American foreign relations history. They were very critical variables for President Ronald Reagan. He was extraordinarily conscious of critical things like what? The role of ideas, the importance of power, the nature of threat perception. So in a sense, my grappling with these issues in the era after 9-11 was consistent with the way I've tried to go about examining other eras of American foreign policy, including the end of the Cold War under Ronald Reagan, which was a critical part of my book, as you know, called For the Soul of, of Mankind. And that's one that's here on the bookshelves at the Reagan Institute, and I encourage our listeners to pick up as well. Uh, but so let's uh, let's get into the inspiration for writing this book. And um, you, you you took a different path for actually writing it and researching it, if I have that right. The, the sources weren't as readily at hand as as they might have been for when you were writing your earlier books on the the uh, start of the Cold War or other dimensions of U.S. foreign policy. So what's the what's the inspiration, and how you how did you go about getting book complete? Well, th you know, thanks for, thanks for that question. And I should uh, preface my answer to your question by emphasizing that I do not have the hubris at all to think that this is the definitive history of the Bush decision to invade Iraq. I'd like to think that it's one of the best 
histories or accounts that we now have. But I'm totally cognizant, as you know very well, that most of the American archival record has not yet been open. I made a very strong effort to use as many declassified records as I could, and I supplemented my efforts by, by using British records that have come out of a parliamentary inquiry in Great Britain. I've used the captured Iraqi records. I used the printed UN sources to assess the inspection process uh, in, in late 2002 and 2003. The inspiration to do all of this, frankly, was I lived through this period. I say in the preface that literally on the morning of September 11th, 2001, at around 8.30 a.m., I walked right past the White House on the way to the Woodrow Wilson International Center. I was in that building when the attacks occurred on the World Trade Center and really right across the river. I remember Washington vividly. The very next year, when these things were still so resonant on my mind and in the mind of all Americans, um, I was a visiting professor at Oxford in England, and I was there during the months leading up to the war, to the, to the invasion of Iraq. And I was engulfed by the whirlwind of controversy and acrimony by British students and British academics over the nature of American foreign policy. I was not inclined then to defend American foreign policy or really to criticize it, but I was beleaguered with questions every single day as a result, I actually wound up giving my big Harmsworth lecture on 9-11 and American foreign policy, rather than the intent when I went to England, which was to give a lecture on the dynamics of the end of the Cold War. There was just so much interest in American foreign policy after 9-11. And I myself then became convinced that just as the beginning of the Cold War under Truman and just as the end of the Cold War under Reagan and George H.W. Bush, the months and years right after 9-11 constituted a transformative moment in the history of American foreign policy. Hence, I wanted to study it. And I was lucky, you ask about the inspiration, I was very lucky to meet Eric Edelman, who had been the foreign policy expert, first to stroke Talbot under, under uh, Bill Clinton, and then most importantly to Dick Cheney um, during 2001 and 2002. Eric Edelman then went to serve as ambassador to Turkey and came back and was the Under Secretary of Defense under Rumsfeld and under Gates from 2005 to 2008. I met Eric Edelman serendipitously at the Miller Center at the University of Virginia. We had lunch. Uh, he was extraordinarily well acquainted with the scholarship I had previously done, and he sort of asked me, why don't I write something really significant about American foreign policy after 9-11? I told him I would like to, but I knew I would never have sufficient access to archival sources. He said that was right, but that if I were inclined to go ahead, he would help me get interviews with his former colleagues like Scooter Libby, Paul Wolfowitz, Steve Hadley, etc. I didn't think Eric would really make good on that commitment. And I didn't know if I really would go ahead and write a book anyway. But what stunned me was that within a couple of weeks, Eric wrote me and said, look, Mel, I can set up these interviews, start setting up interviews with you if you're inclined to move ahead. I said, yes. 
and that began the, the that began an interviewing process that literally went on for 10 or 11 years. I started doing interviews in 2010. First, it was with some of Eric Edelman's close associates. But thanks to my contacts with Lee Hamilton, I got to speak to General Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, and to Richard Armitage, the Deputy Secretary of State. Thanks to my contacts at the Central Intelligence Agency, I got to speak to interview Michael Morell, who was President Bush's daily briefer during 2001. Um, I was able to interview Michael Morell for four or five hours. So over a period of 10 or 11 years, I conducted interviews with almost all leading members of the administration, including Vice President Cheney, except, admittedly, except with President Bush himself, who did not want to be interviewed. So those that's the inspiration, the importance of the topic, and my ability to conduct my own unique set of extensive interviews, and my own commitment to really go to the archival sources themselves and to get as many documents as I could, um, knowing throughout as I do to this day, that I only have had had, I've had very limited access to the full range of sources. But I think I've done a pretty good job with what is now available. Well, I, mean, I guess it all starts with the power of breaking bread. It seems, uh, it seems that we um, have recently had a number of, of those interview subjects um, on our own podcast. I, I believe Steve Hadley was here just a couple weeks ago. Um, so what a good what a good uh, segue into into kind of diving more into this book, specifically starting with the cast of characters. You kind of covered that a little bit with the interview, but um, if you could lay out the cast of characters, because one of the interventions you really seem to make with this book is uh, is to answer the question of who is in charge, and I, I think you you make a pretty strong argument for her, for who you believe is in charge. So please go ahead. Yes, well, I purposefully start the book with two chapters, the first on Saddam Hussein, the second on the career of the education and background and career of George W. Bush up until 9-11. So the, the book starts with these two biographical chapters because my evidence convinced me that these are the two key decision makers. Of course, no one would dispute that Saddam Hussein was the key decision maker in Iraq. And what I do in my first chapter on Saddam Hussein is to try to illuminate the person himself and to inject some complexity to what we think we know about him. I wanted to show in the book that Saddam Hussein experienced significant success in running Iraq as the number two person during the 1970s. He successfully orchestrated the nationalization of the oil industry. He then used the, the revenues, the spiraling revenues from the sale of oil to help modernize Iraq, to build up its industry, to diversify its agriculture, and most importantly, to promote education and health and welfare. Saddam had a lot of support inside Iraq for his achievements. But at the same time, I want to show that this man was repressive, cruel, barbaric, megalomaniac. I wanted to show how systematically he eradicated his enemies and gathered power. And then by looking quickly at Saddam's policies in the 1980s and in 1990 and 91, I wanted to illuminate the mistakes that he made, the egregious errors that he made that undermined most of his achievements that he had undertaken in the 1970s. But I wanted to show him as an adventurer, as an opportunist, 
as a really pragmatic, but at the same time, ruthless ind individual who had huge ambitions. So that's the chapter on Saddam Hussein uh, in, the, in the 1990s. I wanted to write a chapter about George W. Bush because I became convinced that George W. Bush was the key decision maker in the United States. Now, frankly, Anthony, as a historian of American foreign relations, I was not surprised to find out that the president was the key decision maker <laughs> for foreign policy in the, in, in the United States. What is surprising and remains surprising is the degree to which Bush is presented as a secondary actor in so many of the accounts about American foreign policy after 9-11. So many journalistic accounts and quite a few of the scholarly accounts present Vice President Cheney or Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, or most usually Paul Wolfowitz, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, or Douglas Fife, the Undersecretary, as the key decision makers. There is a, what I would say, a mythology has arisen that neocons like Paul Wolfowitz and Douglas Fife were shaping and determining the policies of the Bush administration. And what I show in my book with evidence is that that is simply not the case. George W. Bush was the key decision maker. He was the one who decided on a global war on terror right after 9-11, immediately. He was the one who decided to focus on Afghanistan initially, not Iraq. He was the one who then shifted focus to Iraq. But the focus did not mean a commitment to go to war. It meant a commitment to try to ascertain what was going on with Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, and if possible, to bring about regime change. He accepted the goal of regime change that had been initiated during the Clinton years, but when he talked about regime change, and when most of his advisors talked about regime change prior to 9-11, None of them were thinking about a massive American invasion of Iraq. In fact, as I show in the book, that whenever they discussed Iraq, and it was not a top priority before 9-11, but whenever they discussed Iraq before 9-11, they were unable to come to any policy conclusions. After the Taliban were defeated in Afghanistan after al-Qaeda terrorists were forced to flee from their camps. Then President Bush shifted attention to Iraq. He decided on that. He then decided on a course of coercive diplomacy. He was the one who, in the summer of 2002, Against the advice of Rumsfeld and Cheney and the Joint Chiefs, Bush decided not to bomb terrorist camps in northeastern Iraq. He was the one, against the advice of Dick Cheney and Paul Wolfowitz, who decided to go back to the United Nations for a resolution. So on and on, I tried to show that George W. Bush uh, was the key decision maker, not the neocons, not Dick Cheney, not Donald Rumsfeld. You do kind of point this out, and it actually does seem to be somewhat of a a, a common theme in uh, contemporary and journalistic accounts of consecutive Republican administrations. Uh, if you go from well Reagan and skipping Bush forty one, but then to Bush forty three, and then to Trump, as to who's actually controlling the the foreign policy uh, decision making process and um, so it, it it's certainly a, a key intervention to how we've thought about uh, the build up to the Iraq War. Uh, you do show that Bush seems to indicate or, or display a measure of restraint in, in planning for the war, and and one of those 
ways he does that, as you point out, is uh, engaging the international community. You mentioned the well, UN and also the British, if you could comment uh, a little bit on the British. Yeah, well, what's m most important here is I show that in late December and January, late December 2001, two or three months after 9-11, and in January 2002 and February 2002, Bush embarked upon a course of what he liked to call coercive diplomacy. It was Condoleezza Rice, his national security advisor, who introduced him to the concept of coercive diplomacy. But Bush was naturally attracted to it and already engaged in it because he had already authorized the head of CENTCOM, of Central Command, General Tommy Franks, to begin devising a war plan for war in against Iraq. But what I try to show in the book explicitly is that war planning, which did begin in December of 2001 and then went on for the next 14, 15 months, that war planning did not mean a commitment to go to war. And in fact, I cite interviews that General Tommy Franks conducted, not with me, but, but with others at the University of Virginia's Miller Center project, in which Tommy Franks talks about his meeting, like his first critical meeting with George Bush down at, the, the, at Bush's ranch um, in Texas, in which they, for the first time, reviewed the war plan. This is Christmas time, 2001. And Frank said, literally, explicitly, I never got the impression that the president was committed to going to war. I did know, after speaking to him, that he wanted us to be in a better position to wage war if he should so decide that he wanted to do so. And so what I then show in the, in the book is that Bush conducted this policy of what he and Condi, Condi Rice like to call uh, coercive di diplomacy. I also emphasize, and this is very important in the book, that the practice of coercive diplomacy by Bush and Condi Rice was deeply flawed. It was beset with contradictory or, or intersecting, conflicting goals. For example, on the one hand, Bush wanted to use coercive diplomacy to force Saddam Hussein to flee, to bring about regime change. On the other hand, he wanted to use coercive diplomacy to force Saddam Hussein to welcome back the UN inspectors and to disclose and destroy his weapons of mass destruction. So there were these two competing goals that were part of coercive diplomacy. What I show in the book is that Tony Blair and the British played a critical role convincing Bush that he could not just go to war to bring about regime change, that the, the aim of coercive diplomacy had to be to force Saddam to allow back the inspectors and to come clean on his alleged weapons of mass destruction. And Tony Blair and the British, and by the way, so did Secretary of State Powell, you know, told Bush, asked Bush, and said, you know, if we apply this policy of coercive diplomacy, and if Saddam Hussein, under pressure, agrees to open up Iraq again to the inspectors, and if he fully cooperates, then Tony Blair said to President Bush, we have to accept yes for an answer. We have to, we have to be prepared to accept the continuation of the regime if we can be assured that he is complying with the UN resolutions about destroying 
his weapons of mass destruction. President Bush wasn't really happy with that, but he grudgingly, in the words, in in, in the word of of Secretary of State Powell, he grudgingly accepted that. He grudgingly acknowledged that if, in fact, Hussein did acquiesce to a new UN resolution, and if he cooperated fully, then the United States would have to accept yes for an answer. Now, let me emphasize that neither Blair nor Bush expected Saddam Hussein to co to open up and cooperate. But the important point was that they said to one another, and David Manning said this to Condi Rice, and Condi Rice said it to David Manning, that should Saddam unexpectedly cooperate, then we will have to accept yes. Um, and this was of critical importance, and it means that in understanding the the dynamics leading to the invasion, one has to look at Saddam Hussein's agency as well as the agency of Bush and his advisors. Saddam Hussein, in well, th really, in the months after two thousand and one, and certainly throughout two thousand and two, had the opportunity to comply with UN resolutions, to shift his orientation, to demonstrate that he did not have weapons of mass destruction if he did not have them, to fully cooperate with the UN inspectors under Hans Blix's ins inspection team. He had the opportunity to do these things if he wanted to do so. Um, but for the most part, he did not want to do so. Grudgingly, in September and October and November of 2002, he accepts the new UN resolution when force begins to be deployed. Uh, but at the same time, as I show meticulously in the book, he really was unwilling to fully cooperate. And this was not simply the view of George W. Bush. This was the view of Hans Blix, the head of the inspection team. We all know in every history of this period, we all know that Hans Blix became exasperated with the Bush administration, really angry with the Bush administration over what he considered its rush to war, because slowly in February, in January and February and March 2003, he was seeing that Saddam grudgingly was cooperating more and more, not fully, but more and more. Weapons were, for the most part, not being discovered. And Blix thought strongly that there should be more time before going to war. But at the same time, what is almost never reported in the histories of this period is that Hans Blix fully agreed with Bush that it was important to apply coercive diplomacy. He fully agreed that Saddam Hussein would not invite back the inspectors, would not cooperate unless threatened with force. And so, it, and, and during the process itself, he said again and again, Saddam Hussein has yet to fully strategically cooperate. And although Blix was at times exasperated with Saddam Hussein, he became far more exasperated with Bush and with Rice at the very end. But until the very end, he actually was fully on board, as he says again and again in his memoirs. He knew that Saddam Hussein and George W. Bush were playing a game of chicken, and he was worried how it would end. But he knew that the game of chicken was necessary in order to get Saddam Hussein to comply. So you, you've spoken pretty thoroughly about, about Blix and Bush and, and the kind of American and Western side and the international side of that game of chicken. Going back to the, the point you made earlier that Saddam has agency, that you lay out, he kind of mismanages Western perceptions of, of, of WMDs. But... Um, what you know? What is Saddam's motive 
um, for for governing the way he does? Who's he, who is he really afraid of? Um, and this this question of inspectors and how to treat the inspectors, um, one seems to confuse his his own staff and advisors as you lay out. Right, you're never really quite sure if he really wants them to cooperate or if he wants them to to kind of pull the wool over their eyes. And two, does he believe in the the threat of uh, uh, the American threat? Is coercive dip- diplomacy credible in Saddam's eyes, or is there a domestic and Iranian component as well? I think you kind of talk about that. Maybe I'm setting you up for the answer I want, but I'll let you go ahead. Well, I mean, those those are very important questions, and uh, you know, ma- many people now have looked. Uh, not many, but there are some really good scholars who have looked carefully at this uh, u- using some Iraqi records. And of course, much of what we know that's pertinent to, pertinent to the very good question you, questions you just asked, much of what we know comes from Saddam's own generals and advisors who were captured after the American invasion and who subsequently were interviewed at great length. And they often have commented about what motivated Saddam. We also know a little bit about this, I would say, from the fact that Saddam himself was captured. And while he was in prison, before he was hung, uh, he was interviewed at length um, by an by an Amer- by an American Arabic speaking uh, interviewer from the FBI, and those interviews have actually been published. They're available on the internet, and Saddam Hussein in those interviews speaks extensively about his entire career and also talks about some of his concerns uh, during this period of 2001-2002. The short answer to your your very good question is that Saddam Hussein did not want to reveal that he had no weapons of mass destruction, that he had gotten rid of them, because he actually wanted his domestic foes, like the Kurds and some of the Shia in the South, and he wanted the Iranians and the Israelis, his traditional foes, to think that he actually did have weapons of mass destruction, that this was his leverage with them, that this constituted his ability to exert influence and and power. So he had to, you know, decide, well, do I want to reveal this to the Americans and let my real adversaries at home and in the region know that I don't have these weapons? Or do I want to make the bet that the Americans will threaten, but they will not really invade? Or if they invade, they will not really march to Baghdad and overthrow me. And it is clear from many comments that Saddam made to his closest advisors and to interlocutors over time that, in effect, he thought America was a paper tiger, that the United States did not have the stomach, the fortitude, the courage to really with to really go to war and engage in direct combat and incur significant casualties and deaths he did not think that the united states had the stomach for that and he often cited you know well the united states you know was going to intervene in somalia and clinton pulled out the troops George George H. W. Bush, his father, had the opportunity to march to Baghdad, but did he? No, he didn't march to Baghdad. I remained in power, and Bush lost the next the next election. Um, so Saddam Hussein, by all accounts, did not think that the United States would really invade and march to Baghdad and face the prospect of 
of significant casualties. And what he was trying to do during the last few weeks of the inspections was to work very hard to try to divide the French and the Germans and the Russians from the British and the Americans. He was thinking that if I can undermine the cohesion within the Security Council, if I can undermine that cohesion, I will make it extremely difficult for Bush to actually go to war. So that those were the diplomatic and military calculations bearing on Saddam Hussein's decision making. Mel, you know, one of the things you um, kind of suggest in those answers uh, is that um, red lines in American foreign policy um, do have consequences. Um, and it's a game played by by both the, in this case, by Saddam and, 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 and George Bush. But uh, can you give me a little sense about your view of red lines in American foreign policy and, and maybe how this uh, this particular red line and coercive diplomacy approach was shaped by by earlier episodes or has shaped succeeding episodes um, for the U.S. Well, the, the red line here, so, so to speak, although it wasn't quite defined that way, but in effect, the, the, the red line was Saddam's full cooperation with the UN inspection team, with the assumption by Bush and his advisors that full cooperation would lead to the disclosure of the alleged weapons of mass destruction and to the, and to the destruction of these weapons. So the, the red line was full cooperation. And it is clear in the record, both the interviewing record and the written record, that Bush, the British, and Hans Blix, the head of the inspection team, were all sorely disappointed when on December 7th or December 8th, 2002, Saddam Hussein's government submitted its so-called declaration of weapons of mass destruction to Hans Blix's inspection team, and that that declaration, which in effect was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pa pages about the history, location, and past efforts to deal with, with the weapons of mass destruction, that that declaration was sorely disappointing. Everyone who looked at it agreed that no progress had really been made. And in effect, that, that confirmed to Bush that the regime was not willing to cooperate and collaborate and come clean. Now, I would criticize, and I do criticize, the Bush administration for not offering sufficient incentives in the course of so-called coercive diplomacy to elicit to elicit the information that the administration wanted the administration did not provide incent enough incentives for Saddam really to cooperate. I fault the administration for that. But from the administration's perspective, Saddam Hussein's regime failed in December of 2002 to come clean. And as a result of that, the administration felt that, yes, a red line, so to speak, was being transgressed week after week day after day, week after week, month after month, in December, January, and February, Bush felt increasingly that Saddam was, you know, toying with him, playing with him, defying him, and in a sense, in, to use your words, crossing a red line, and that in effect, Saddam Hussein 
was testing America's credibility. America's credibility was linked to that red line. America's credibility was linked to forcing Saddam Hussein to live up to America's view of Iraq's commitments under the UN resolutions, and that Saddam was playing games and therefore transgressing a red line. And that sense that America's credibility was being tested became a defining issue in January and February and March of 2003. Now, let's jump ahead and, and move ahead quickly, almost really to mirror the pace of events. Um, the invasion takes place, and it's in some ways rapidly successful in achieving the occupation of Baghdad or capturing Baghdad, as you lay out. In fact, almost too, too successful in the sense that um, uh, that it jumped ahead of planning. Bring us to what you might call the start the initial moment of post-war reconstruction of Iraq and how the different bureaucratic interests and agendas and goals kind of begin to manifest themselves in Baghdad and throughout the country. And, and I, I do want to just point out with, by way of anecdote, um, a party you reference in which uh, some of the, some of the, the guest list was a little more um, restricted than you might think might think of uh, i think it was dick cheney's party that you if you want to talk about that that was a really kind of um, uh, illuminating a uh, little uh, little piece of history well what what i try to show in the book is that the liberation and occupation of iraq went awry because of terrible planning inside the administration. Terrible planning, insufficient planning with regard to what would happen in the so-called phase four of the war. So in planning for the war in Iraq all during 2002, there was considerable systematic attention and constant rearrangings, so to speak, of the combat plan but very little attention was focused on phase four, the post-war reconstruction and stabilization. Little attention was focused on that until almost the time of the invasion itself. This was a huge planning failure. And essentially, I think I am in accord with most writers in assigning major blame to Donald Rumsfeld and to the CENTCOM commander, Tommy Franks. Neither of them were very interested in what would happen inside Iraq after Saddam Hussein was toppled and after the United States could confirm that the, his alleged weapons of mass destruction were no more or were found and, and destroyed. That's what Franks and that's what Rumsfeld were interested in. I show in the book that President Bush himself was interested, very interested in promoting freedom and something like democracy inside Iraq after the United States would occupy the country. That is not why he went to war. I'm very clear that his motive for going to war was not to promote freedom. It was to promote American security broadly defined. But he believed that if the United States did go to war, it was America's obligation and America's opportunity to promote freedom and nurture freedom. In this sense, he was very much inspired, explicitly inspired by Ronald Reagan, by the victory in the Cold War, 
by the knowledge that in 1989 and 1990, when the Berlin Wall came down, throngs of people gathered in Berlin and then in other capital cities in Eastern Europe, championing freedom and the new liberation. And clearly, Bush was interested in this. He wanted the United States to promote freedom if the United States invaded. What the problem was is that President Bush did not demand or insist that Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld and General Franks pay attention to this objective and prepare for it. And what I show in the book is that the planning, the last minute planning was very impromptu. It was not carefully done. There was continual discord amongst high administration officials about what the goals really were. And there was rampant incompetence and incoherence and tremendous amount of acrimony inside Iraq, inside Baghdad, between the various military agent between the various military commands and between some of the civilians who who were there from various departments tremendous rancor and 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 and, and contestation about what the objectives were and a lot of this acrimony was mirrored inside the White House and inside the agencies of the American government. Bush himself did, I show in the book, did a very poor job in terms of making his own objectives clear and, and failing to insist on proper planning from his subordinates. And hence, as I illuminate in, in the book, it became clear within the first two or three months that there would be rampant disorder and the potential for a massive insurrection. So there's a, a verily, uh, really good conclusion that you, you put on this book, Fear, Power, Hubris. Um, but before even we get dump into, jump into that, and maybe in relation to this conclusion, you point out the lessons that Bush hoped to draw from American success at the end of the Cold War and throughout the 1980s with policy that might be somewhat similar to corrosive diplomacy, peace through strength. Um, these things seem to offer lessons for for the Bush administration, um, you know, tell us a little bit of maybe why those lessons were misread or misapplied. Um, tell us a little bit maybe about your quick recap, your your three points of 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 motives, plannings, and outcomes, and then and then last, very critically, what are the lessons we need to take away um, for today? Uh, uh, as we contemplate the the war in Iraq 20 years on? Well, my conclusion is defined in three terms, fear, power, and hubris. Fear, power, and hubris help to illuminate why the United States invaded Iraq and why the post-war occupation and liberation went so badly. So first, fear. There were two aspects to the fear. One was Bush's fear, great fear, that Saddam might hand off his chemical and biological weapons to terrorists, not necessarily, not necessarily to al-Qaeda terrorists, but to any terrorists, that Saddam Hussein might allow his weapons of mass destruction to fall into the hands of terrorists who would inflict harm on the United States, on Americans, or on American allies. That was one aspect of fear. Uh, 
The other aspect of fear and threat perception was articulated again and again by Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, and Paul Wolfowitz. Fear that as Saddam Hussein continued to evade the sanctions, which was happening, he would gather strength, which had been going on in the late 1990s. He would gather strength. He would reactivate, if he hadn't started already, he would reactivate his weapons of mass destruction programs, and he would use his WMD in the future to blackmail the United States. That word blackmail is repeated again and again in the written record. What policymakers meant was that if Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction in the future, he would, he would be able to impel the United States to self-deter, to paralyze the United States from taking future action in a crisis. Now, keep in mind that 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 is what motivates America's non-proliferation policies to this day in in many different countries. Uh, we don't want other countries to get weapons of mass destruction, not simply because we don't want them to use them, which is obviously an objective, but because their very presence will mean that they can use the threat of those weapons to paralyze American action, to blackmail the United States, to stop the United States from doing what it might other, otherwise do. So there were these two aspects to fear. Now, power was simple. The United States knew that it had the power to defeat Saddam Hussein and to overcome the th the threats that I just outlined, if it wanted to employ its force. The United States knew that it had the power to do that. Of course, it takes one dimension of power to defeat an army. It takes many other dimensions of power to build economic infrastructure and transform the political and social institutions of another country. And so power needs to be th thought of in many different dimensions. The United States had the power to do one thing, but not the power to do another. Fear and power and hubris. Hubris was the sense of American superiority, the sense that Iraqis would simply welcome American liberation and occupation, the belief that Iraqis would assign more importance to the prospect of freedom in the future than the reality of security and order and national sovereignty and national identity in the present. So Bush and his advisors were you know, not aware of the degree to which many Iraqis distrusted the United States, were not inclined to embrace Americans. Why did they distrust Americans? From their perspective, like from the perspective of the Kurds in the North, the United States had sold them out repeatedly over many decades. So the Kurds distrusted the United States. They relied on the United States, but they were also suspicious of the United States. The Shia in the South was suspicious of the United States because Bush's own father in 1991 had encouraged them to rise up against Saddam Hussein and then had done nothing when Saddam Hussein systematically massacred them. So there was a lot of distrust for the United States, but the hubris of Americans was not to think that those things mattered, was to think that, oh, the notions of freedom and democracy would be so inspiring as to trump all these other factors. So fear, power, and hubris account for the invasion, and they also account for the failure of the liberation and, and the occupation.
And you say, finally, um, Anthony, you, you, you know, you asked me to talk about lessons, and I've thought a lot about lessons. And when I go about speaking about the book, I'm always asked, you know, well, what are the, what are the lessons for today? So let me just quickly spell them out uh, for you and for, for our listeners. I think um, the first is, one, modulate the sense of threat. Modulate the sense of threat. Saddam Hussein never really constituted an existential threat to the United States. He was a horrendously evil, brutal, aggressive dictator, but he was not an existential threat to the United States. Policymakers need to really temper their sense of threat. Americans need to come to their grips with what really constitutes a vital threat or an existential threat. Secondly, the United States needs to grasp the limits of its power. As I indicated a few minutes ago, the United States had the power to win militarily, but the United States did not and often does not have the power to remake other societies and economies, to reshape the political institutions of another country. We need to grasp the limits of our power. Three, we need to curb our hubris. We need to be able to empathize with the perceptions and sensibilities of the people we're dealing with. Four, very important, and incredibly difficult, we need to re-examine core assumptions. Policymakers need to re-examine core assumptions. As I show in the book, the core assumption, and honestly and sincerely held, was that Saddam Hussein's regime had weapons of mass destruction. And there was good reason to have that assumption, because in truth, Saddam had developed weapons of mass destruction. He had used his weapons of mass destruction. He had concealed his weapons of mass destruction. He had lied about his weapons of mass destruction. And previously, the United States had grossly underestimated the progress he had made. So there was good reason to have this assumption. But as I show in the book as well, there were also many reasons that should have led to the reexamination of this core assumption. So re-examining core assumptions when you're going to do something really consequential, like invade another country, is truly important. But it's hard. How many of us re-examine core assumptions? Do I re-examine core assumptions? Do you, Anthony, re-examine core assumptions? It's easy to say that, but it's very hard to do. But it's imperative to do it when you're going to do something truly consequential. Fifth, and I'll stop here because I know we're running out of time, but fifth, you need to assess costs and consequences before you initiate policies. The Bush administration failed to really assess the costs and consequences of going to war in Iraq, of invading Iraq. More saliently, the administration, meaning President Bush and Condi Rice themselves, did not really assess or ask for an assessment of, of costs and consequences before they embarked on the strategy of coercive diplomacy. Once they embarked on it, they locked themselves in and their credibility was increasingly at risk but they should have examined costs and consequences before embarking on a strategy of coercive diplomacy. There are others, but I think you probably want me to wrap things up. <laughs> well, no, I think the, the plug here now is to examine and then re-examine Mel Leffler's latest book, Confronting Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush and the Invasion of Iraq. Thank you very much for, ha for joining us today, Mel. It's been a pleasure. Great speaking to you. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend.